Okay. So, uh, yeah, we've been working down at the greenhouse for about a year now on uh, floral development and mainly some things that might inhibit uh, floral initiation. And so having an obsessive personality, I, every paper you read, they only go back in time through citations. So I keep going back and finding uh, more and more people to read things about. So one thing, I'm sure many people remember it, but I gave a timeline uh, two years ago um, when I gave a seminar on kind of some major points in my field of research, which is the study of phytochrome. And a number of these people we're not going to cover again, but uh, this was more looking at molecular in vitro stuff. But instead, we're going to just cover flowering. And it's a lot of the same early characters in this. Okay. Um, so a lot of this stuff I'm going to cover is generally taught in a about half a lecture in a plant physiology class. And I've got hopefully a full hour to talk about it and give it more in-depth uh, kind of coverage. So this starts um, about 100 years ago with uh, these two guys, uh, Harry Allard and Whitman Gardner at the um, Arlington Experimental Farm. That's depicted here. It's in the bottom of this photo. This is a USDA facility that was right um, off the national, uh, national um, uh, mall. Uh, you can see the uh, Washington National Monument right here in this image. And it was replaced by the Pentagon um, and this uh, research facility moved down the road about 20 miles to this area in Beltsville. Um, so these two guys, Harry Allard and uh, Whitman Gardner, what they had done was Harry Allard uh, was looking at, um, he had some Maryland mammoth tobacco that he moved, uh, kind of cut all the leaves off of and just moved some stumps into a greenhouse to overwinter. And he noticed that while they were in the greenhouse, they started flowering. But as soon as they got moved back into um, the sunlight in full April, they promptly stopped flowering. So he started wondering what the causes were uh, to induce flowering. And in his curiosity, he had his stumps next to some new tobacco seedlings. And he saw that both of them were starting to flower at exactly the same time. So this indicated to both of them that there was some environmental effect, uh, that the plants were sensing the seasons and trying to figure out when to flower based on that. Um, so they tested a whole bunch of things. They tested uh, whether or not the change in temperature from winter might be causing the flowering or the decrease in light intensity in the winter might be causing it. And neither of these seem, things seem to work. And finally, they decided to try out this thing where maybe the plants are measuring the total uh, length of the day. And it actually seemed fairly implausible to them that this would be the case, but they decided to test it out. So in uh, 1918, they had some of this Maryland mammoth tobacco, which was this tobacco plant that got really tall. And uh, they kept it in a dark room until late in the morning and they moved it out into the full summer sun. And then they moved it back into the dark room uh, early in the afternoon. So it got this artificially short day. And when they compared that to plants that were grown out in the full length of the summer day, the plants in the full summer day did not flower while these plants given an artificially short day did. So uh, the following winter, they followed this up with basically the exact opposite experiment with the short, naturally short day in winter. They elongated the day using artificial lighting in a greenhouse and they got exactly the same result in the end in that the plants given the uh, artificially elongated day those didn't flower, whereas the ones naturally under the shorter day length uh, ended up flowering. So this was a great indication to them that, yes, plants are sensing the total length of the day to tell them when to flower. Um, their actual paper that came out kind of describing these results only came out in uh, 1920, so I can still claim that this is one century of research. Um, 
along with this uh, Maryland mammoth tobacco that only flowered given a specific short day length, they continue researching this for about uh, the next 10 to 15 years and found that other plants required some long length of day in order to induce flowering, whereas others required um, a short day at the beginning and a long day at the end or had no um, day length had no effect on flowering. So those were either day neutral plants or plants like Maryland uh, mammoth tobacco, which flowered under a short day. They called those short day plants and then plants that required uh, day length longer than some critical period. Those were long day plants. It turns out that uh, Whitman Gardner was more press friendly and got a lot of the press for uh, this result which privately pissed off Harry Allard. Um, but um, they ended up having a professional relationship despite this. So uh, two guys in um, the University of Chicago heard about this result where plants were sensing day length to tell them about, or to kind of inform the plant as when to flower. Uh, these guys were James Bonner and Carl Hamner. And what they thought was that instead of the total day length, that's inducing flowering. They thought it might be the total night length. So this is a diagram from plant physiology textbook. And you have short day plants here on the left and long day plants on the right. And they're given the same three treatments in each column. So the yellow bar represents the light period. The gray bar represents the dark period. And as I previously mentioned, the dashed line represents that critical uh, light period. If you're above that for a short day plant, you don't flower if you're below that. Uh, you do flower if you're a short day plant and you get exactly the opposite result uh, for a long day plant. But what uh, Bonner and Hamner did was they thought, well, maybe it's measuring the total night length rather than the total day length. So to test this, they provided a pulse of light in the middle of the dark period under a normally uh, short day. And they got pretty satisfying results in that uh, normally this rose plant here would flower under a short day, but a light break in the middle of the night inhibited flowering, but in the long day plant, it promoted flowering. So this practice is actually still used in greenhouses all over the world. Uh, you can provide light break, night break lighting to long day plants to get them to flower at certain points in the year, or you can provide it to a short day plant to keep it nice and vegetative. So um, the USDA facility had moved to Beltsville by this point, and they heard about uh, the research of Bonner and Hamner, and they were pretty interested in what specific wavelengths of light were causing this effect. So hey, they had this instrument down here called a spectrograph, which is basically, it has a light source and it uses prisms to break uh, light up into individual wavelengths. And uh, this was work done by Sterling Hendricks and Harry Borthwick. Uh, Harry Borthwick was a botanist by training and Sterling Hendricks was actually a physical chemist. Uh, so you can see here that they've uh, stripped the, some soybean plants, which is a short day crop, down to just a single leaf. Um, and it could give them a lot more precision of their light treatments. And basically what they found from this was that uh, plants were most sensitive to red light for this night break lighting and somewhat sensitive to blue. Um, so after this, uh, they were able to determine kind of specific wavelengths effects of this night break lighting effect. But they went on to also test other uh, plant physiological parameters like seed germination and stem elongation with their spectrograph to see um, what wavelengths were doing what things for uh, plant development. And one of the things they tested was uh, seed germination. So this came about when they were testing uh, light effects on seed germination. They actually found that while red uh, photons promoted the germination of seeds, if they provided wavelengths that were a little bit lower energy than red, which they called um, infrared and we now call it far red photons, um, that when those were applied to the seeds, you actually got a lower percent germination 
than the dark controls. So they started wondering what would happen if you kind of gave one right after the other. So this is an extremely well-known uh, study in my field of photobiology, and it's called the flip-flop experiment. So if you give uh, lettuce seeds uh, no light, they won't germinate. If you give them a quick pulse of red, and it'll induce germination. You can see the little radicals coming out of the seeds in that second photo. But if you follow this up with a pulse of far red, it re-inhibits um, germination, and you can follow it back up with red, re-induce it, far red, um, inhibit it again. So what they ended up postulating was that there was this pigment, and that pigment ended up being called uh, phytochrome eventually, that had two forms. One was a red absorbing form, and one was a far red absorbing form. And this uh, acted like an on and off switch. You can think of it as a light switch, where red light flicked the switch on, and far red light switch the, um, flip the switch off. After they figured this out, this uh, led to a whole bunch of research in the field of phytochrome. And it's actually credited with the discovery of phytochrome. But they wanted to see if this uh, experiment uh, for seed germination also applied to uh, the earth stuff they had originally worked on, which was inhibition of uh, flower initiation. So this is yet another photo from a plant physiology or an image from a plant physiology textbook. And they're doing the same experiment. They provide that night break lighting here right in the middle uh, with red light. And that inhibited uh, flowering development in a short day plant. But if they followed that up with a far red uh, pulse, it re-induced uh, flowering. Red inhibited, far red induced. Now this is a figure from a plant physiology textbook, but if we actually take a closer look at the data, um, this is the top table is a table from the original Borthwick paper from 1952. And the bottom table is from a paper a few years later on a flip-flop study in flowering development. So they're working with two different short day plants in this bottom table. One is uh, cockleburr, which is just a weed. Um, and the other one is a soybean. The way they measured flowering development here is just basically by an index. So the higher the number in this bottom table, the more promotive the uh, stage of flowering development and the lower number, uh, the more inhibitory. So you can see that in the top table, a red pulse induced about nearly 100% germination, whereas a red pulse in the middle of the dark period for flowering brought the flowering stage from a high level of six or four, respectively, down to zero. If you followed that up with far red, you would bring germination down to about 50%, whereas you would reinduce uh, flowering in these short day plants. But if we kind of keep going with this table, you can actually do this uh, flip-flop experiment for germination a hundred times and still get the same result. Red induces germination, far red inhibits. But if you actually look at the flowering results, after about four iterations of this red far red flipping, um, both of these short day plants were pretty inhibitory, nearly a zero on their flowering index. So this indicates that Far red actually has some um, inhibitory effects on flowering. So this, uh, despite the fact that this is in a plant physiology textbook, it's not quite right. Um, so they're generally pretty fast. It depends on the experiment. Uh, Paul, I don't know if anyone heard, but Paul Johnson asked how quick are the pulses. They can be anywhere between in some cases, six seconds, and other cases, several hours. And a lot of these experiments tested this idea of reciprocity, which is not the, it's the total number of photons that induce the effect. So you can provide a lot of photons for a short period or a few photons for a long period. And generally you get the same effect. So this is an action spectra of these two forms of phytochrome. So we have wavelength here across the bottom and what is kind of the absorbance spectra of both forms? Again, this light pink line is the inactive form of phytochrome, and the dark red line is the active form. 
And basically what these curves represent is at that wavelength of photon, it's how likely it is to be absorbed by that form of phytochrome and then convert to the other form. And then we have the spectrum of a near infrared LED here on the far right hand side of the graph. And NIR LEDs are used in security cameras. They're also used as reference points for digital imaging. Um, and because they're used for security cameras, we wanted to know whether or not in growth facilities and greenhouses or grow rooms, whether or not the use of security cameras could potentially inhibit uh, flowering, especially since uh, in lieu of the results we saw previously. And you can also see here, see here in this insect graph that the near infrared output spectra overlaps a little bit with the PR action spectra, which would induce an activation of the phytochrome molecule. And here, activation of the phytochrome molecule means uh, inhibition of flowering. Uh, one more thing to say about this slide is that there's actually a lot of uncertainty regarding what this absorbance spectra is beyond about 750 nanometers. And this is just kind of an, an issue with measurements in spectrophotometers. Okay, so this is the experimental setup. I hope you can all see it. Um, what I did was I turned off all the lights in the growth room um, in the, of the greenhouse. And if you look here at the very top of the photo, there's two extremely faint uh, red lines here. And that's the output from the NIR LEDs. They're basically on the very edge of human vision. Uh, so we can just barely see the tail end of these uh, photons. This is brightening it to see, you can actually see some plants there at the bottom of this growth chamber and there are the lights. Uh, so to measure flower um, initiation and flowering development, we basically created an index like the previous studies. But what we did is we kind of just defined when the flower hit about two millimeters in diameter, we called that flowering and before that it wasn't. And this is kind of a stages of flowering de development in hemp, which is, as a side note, a bit of a model crop for uh, these flowering studies. Uh, Harry Borthwick, who I mentioned earlier, did a bunch of studies on hemp, um, looking at night pollution effects on inhibiting flower development uh, for hemp. And it's among one of the most sensitive species. So in the top photo, there's no flowering. In the middle photo, if you look right in the middle here, there's a tiny little flower starting to form. And that's an obvious flower by that point. So in this graph here on the uh, left-hand side, it's uh, days after we've started the short days. And the y-axis of that graph is flower diameter. This is a short day plant uh, hemp. So under the dark control, it had the uh, quickest growth in flower diameter. Whereas uh, a small amount of light pollution from these NIR LEDs delayed flowering by a little bit. And that can be seen here. I called this a uh, far, far red because it's uh, instead of being 700 to 750, it's photons kind of between 750 and 800 nanometers. Um, and these intensities here used for the NIR LEDs are about the intensity of uh, maybe when this room is all the way, all the lights are on, it'd be about 5.5 micromoles per meter square per second of photons. But now that we have about half the lights on, that's about 2.7. So from this, we were able to determine that yes, uh, photons from security cameras can potentially delay flowering in hemp. Although it should be noted that these are fairly high intensities and what security cameras would actually use are quite a bit lower. So you would only really get this inhibition if you were had a plant right next to a security camera. Um, we did the same thing in soybean. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but you can see that the near infrared LEDs is along, along with inhibiting flowering also elongated the stems. But here, basically we got the same results with NIR is the left column, without NIR is the right column. You can see that the days to flower is increased when we applied the NIR photons to soybeans. Soybeans. 
Okay, so coming back to our timeline, that was one study we had done in the greenhouse. Um, this is kind of going backwards from Hendricks and Borthwick a little bit. Their studies, especially on the flip-flop experiment, was done in the 1950s. But I want to talk about this guy now. Um, I've been practicing his name. His name is pronounced Mikhail Kristoforovich Chalkhin. Uh, he's a Russian scientist from the USSR. Um, and his experiment involved, you can see him in his greenhouse here. And if you look closely at some of those plants, you notice they have bags over some of the leaves. And what he discovered was that the actual organ that was responsible for sensing uh, the length of the day was the leaves and not the meristems. So he hypothesized that there was some hormone being uh, synthesized in the leaves that moved up to the apical meristem to start changing uh, cellular development into flowers. This hormone remained um, a mystery for many decades. No one could figure out what it was until relatively recently, and I'll get into that later. So after him, uh, there was this guy, Erwin Buning. Um, and before we get into Erwin Buning, um, although we've talked about how plants um, are sensing that uh, they know when to flower based on either the length of the day or the length of the night. Actually, how plants are keeping time remained a bit of a mystery. And Hendricks and Borthwick, here to the left of Erwin Buning, had a hypothesis in which um, if you think of phytochrome as this on and off switch, it turns out when you leave the switch on for too long, it'll eventually slowly turn back off. It's just this thermal a reversion um, because the um, PR inactive form is thermodynamically favored compared to the active form. So they thought that this slow, it's called dark reversion. It's not um, caused by light or anything, but this slow dark reversion is what's actually measuring time in the plants. Um, and they call this the hourglass hypothesis because they thought of uh, the active form of phytochrome as sand in an hourglass slowly moving through this um, hourglass. And that's how the plants were telling time. Erwin Buning, back in the 1930s, thought that plants might have this internal clock. Uh, and he was somewhat kind of laughed at for this idea because most scientists at the time had a hard time imagining uh, any kind of internal clock that any biological organism would have mainly because they were thinking about things in terms of uh, thermodynamics and rates of reactions moving in either direction. He came up with this hypothesis in the 1930s, um, but he was uh, a German and he was a ardent anti-Nazi person. And he actually had to flee out of uh, Germany. And he picked up his research again in the 1950s uh, with an improved uh, model of um, this uh, circadian clock idea or endogenous internal clock. And he figured that one, um, there was a light loving phase of the plant and a night loving phase. Um, and that's somehow some internal clock that caused this response. So the next person I'm gonna talk about, Larry, do you know who this is? This is Frank Salisbury. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this is the rest of the photo. Um, you might be able to recognize this person here on the right-hand side. Frank Salisbury was department head of this department, Plant Soils and Climate, back in the 1970s. Um, and he played a pretty big role in, uh, he was a huge, big fan of this endogenous clock hypothesis. And he did not like the hypothesis of Hendricks and Borthwick. And he ended up playing a pretty big role in kind of outlining some of the experiments that showed that plants do have this internal clock that can help them uh, keep time. Along with this, uh, we'll get into this in a second, but he was also played a pretty big role in how the light to dark cycles play a role in, in training the clock back and forth. All right, so I don't know if this is gonna work. Okay, so I have a video here of um, an example of circadian rhythms within plants. 
This is what I'm going to show you here is an effect that's been fairly well known in plants for, I think, about 300 years. Uh, I wrote the guy, Frenchman's name on my hand, Demeran, is a guy in 1730 who uh, found that plants' leaves are horizontal during the daytime, but during the nighttime they start to fold down. And what uh, Demeran did was he moved the plants into the darkness. And um, despite the fact that there was no light signals, the plant still showed a daily horizontal leaf when they would expect morning and vertical leaf orientation and they thought it was evening. So this is just some amateur guy's video on YouTube. He's filming these at night with a near infrared night camera. Normally the sun would come up at 7 a.m. and you can see that the leaves start to predict uh, the onset of daylight. Uh, before it actually comes on. Now, instead of keeping the plants in the dark for this long period, this guy ends up turning the light back on when it would normally go into the dark period and you would see the uh, leaves start to fold back down. But I think you can sort of see it here uh, in a second that they kind of start to lose their vigor um, right about now. And this would be a time where they would normally be experiencing the dark. I'm gonna fast forward it to the end just so you can see this again. So you can see that before the light comes up, uh, the leaves start to come into a horizontal position. Um, and as soon as the light turns off, that they go back into this vertical orientation. And again, the next day, before the sun even comes up, the leaves start to come up. So this is one example of kind of a circadian oscillation that's been well known in plants for a long time. And this is kind of where uh, Erwin Buning's hypothesis originally came from. So in uh, flowering development, they did a pretty similar study to uh, de Moran back in the 1700s in that uh, they took plants that have been tra entrained in a circadian rhythm and moved them into this extremely long dark period. So um, this is a 72 hour dark period in this graph and they provided different night break lighting pulses at different points in this uh, extended dark period. And they found that early into the dark period, normally when the plant would be experiencing a nighttime, these uh, night break lightings were extremely inhibitory for flowering. But as you move further, about 24 hours to 32 hours, this would be a point when the plant would normally be experiencing a uh, daylight uh, period. If you provide the light at those points, then there's basically no inhibition of flowering. But then again, if you go an even longer period into this uh, several day dark period, inhibition of flowering will again uh, start up around hours 32 to 40. So this is a pretty good example of how there's an internal clock within plants that's moving up and down, back and forth uh, to inhibit uh, flowering if there's light um, present. So I'm gonna move quite a bit forward in terms of history to actually how this circadian oscillation works. So there's two major components here. Um, there's a setting of evening genes which are expressed most highly in the evening and morning genes, which are most highly expressed in the morning. It turns out that the evening genes promote the expression of the morning genes, but the morning genes inhibit the expression of the evening genes. So that's what these two arrows represent. So on the onset of darkness, um, you have a low level of morning genes and your evening gene pool starts to increase. But because your evening gene pool starts to increase, it starts to promote the expression of the morning component. And because the morning component is increasing, it is inhibiting the expression of the evening genes. So that pool starts to decrease. But again, now that the evening gene component is smaller, it's normally expressing the morning genes. So now that pool starts to decrease because it's no longer being expressed as much. And this oscillation just kind of moves back and forth in either direction. And I kind of showed the dawn and dust signals here of how this uh, oscillation moves back and forth between morning and evening components. And it's not just this feedback loop 
that's uh, responsible for um, this or that's going on here. There's also a bunch of other genes that end up being expressed along with these morning and evening components. So the next big guy I want to talk about is uh, Colin Pittenrig. So he, um, there's actually a video I was watching this morning on YouTube of him giving a lecture in 1992. And it's pretty good. I would encourage everyone to check it out. Um, and he came up with this model called the external coincidence model. So one of the things Frank Salisbury thought was going on was that these night break lightings, the reason they were inhibiting flowering was because you're just kind of messing with the circadian rhythm in some way. But the external coincidence model, what this suggests is that while it is true that um, light acts as a pushing uh, force in either direction, and I guess real quickly, moving back into this circadian oscillation of the morning and evening components, um, the light period or the dark period basically act as a push of this swing moving back and forth. And that's actually what a lot of Frank Salisbury's work was on, was how this clock is entrained by this dawn and dusk signal. So light can play a role in this oscillation back and forth. But there are also these components uh, that, because the evening genes are being expressed, there's a point in the circadian rhythm where the plant is extremely sensitive to light. And that's what the external coincidence model suggests. It suggests that there's an external stimuli, in this case, light, that coincides with the internal rhythm with a plant, within the plant. And if that occurs, it either promotes or inhibits flowering, depending on if you're a short day or a long day plant. The last person I wanna talk about is Daphne Vince Prue. She did a lot of work building on the ideas of uh, Salisbury, Buning, and Pittenrig. Um, she wrote a number of textbooks on flowering. She's a huge name. I think she's still alive at like 92 years old right now. Uh, but she built on all of their previous hypotheses. And this external coincidence model is still the model we're using today to kind of say what's going on with uh, flower induction. So because the external coincidence model is still the model we're using, not much has changed since then. Basically, we've come, we've kind of parsed out the minutia of uh, these reactions. So in around 1980, uh, this long known blue light receptor uh, got named cryptochromes. In uh, 1989, it was discovered that in Arabidopsis, there are five different phytochrome proteins. And these two uh, photoreceptors, which are just uh, light absorbing proteins, they both play a role in, in training the circadian clock and potentially inhibiting flowering or promoting it depending on short day or long day. So around the year 2000, this model finally kind of, the pieces started coming out. So what's going on here is you have this uh, gene called CO or constans, and it's part of the evening gene component. So late in the day, in the evening, the CO is highly expressed. And if uh, light lines up with the expression of CO, you activate uh, phytochrome or cryptochrome, and that stabilizes this, stabilizes this CO um, uh, protein. And CO is a promoter of, sorry. Uh, CO is a promoter of this FT protein. FT is the fluorogen hormone that Chalkian suspected existed way back in the 1930s. So this is for the long day plant Arabidopsis. If your um, external stimuli coincides with your CO expression at the end of the day, you pro uh, promote the synthesis of fluorogen and induce flowering. For the short day plants, it's basically exactly the opposite response. This has been most heavily studied in rice. Uh, so again, in the evening time, if you have a high expression of this time, the, uh, it's an inhibitor and it's called HD1. If the expression of that with, along with the evening genes aligns with light and the light is percep perceived through either phytochrome or cryptochrome, this actively inhibits 
rice fluorogen, which is called HD3A, that's not very important. And this is basically how this external coincidence model works. You have um, this circadian rhythm expressing certain promoters. If those promoters line up with the light signals, it'll either promote or inhibit uh, flowering. In the last 20 years, what the main things that have been learned is that there's also anti fluorogen components. The clock is a bit more complex than just this morning component and evening component and a bunch of different pieces are involved. So basically everything just gets more complex uh, from this, but this is the basics of the flowering model. So in the last few minutes, the last thing I wanna talk about is this, uh, going back to this hourglass hypothesis that Hendricks and Borthwick had, where you would have this slow, uh, darker version of PFR back into PR after it's been activated. While that hourglass hypothesis wasn't quite correct, because this reaction is actually based on temperature, it's more appropriately called a thermal reversion. And it's been known that uh, this reversion takes place at different uh, speeds at different temperatures for uh, several decades now. But a few papers in the last five or so years has suggested that phytochrome is actually a temperature sensor. And in this, we want to do, do an experiment of this thermal reversion of phytochrome at different temperatures. So if in hemp, if activated phytochrome, it's activated by light and that inhibits flowering. So at a warmer temperature though, with a small amount of night pollution, you should be able to revert more of that PFR back into PR and reinduce flowering. Whereas a, at a cooler temperature, you're gonna build up a much larger amount of your inactivating PFR pool. So this was our hypothesis for the results. And we conducted a prior experiment to determine about what level of night pollution we should be doing here. This uh, x-axis here is in nanomoles. So you can see it's really low levels of light we're talking about here. When we ran the experiment, we got the exact opposite results. So what's going on here? And that's sort of an open question. I have no idea. Um, it turns out uh, that the cooler night flowered faster than the warmer night. And that's the fact that the, it's lower on the y-axis compared to the warmer night. This is a fairly well-known phenomenon in a number of short day plants. Uh, poinsettia has experienced this, chrysanthemums experienced this, and we found now that hemp experiences this. So this is a um, slide out of Michigan State University showing poinsettias. And on what is basically the x-axis here, we have night temperature, and the y-axis is day temperature. You can see that day temperature doesn't really have any effect on bract color turning in poinsettias. But if you cross this 23 to 26 threshold, you greatly inhibit um, bract form, uh, coloring change or what's basically flowering. However, it turns out that other short day plants like rice flower more quickly under a warmer uh, day. Generally plants flower more quickly during a warm day. So this is kind of the edge of what's going on with flowering. We know that ambient temperature affects rate of floral development, but we don't know what the mechanism is. And if any of you want to tell me what it is, I can open the floor up now, uh, or if you have questions, that's also an option. That's it. I might be able to pull the questions up here, I think. The cam we actually got started working on security cameras because people thought it was creating um, 
what they call hermaphroditism. Um, and I think a more appropriate term for that is um, dioecious flowering. So it, you would end up with male and female flowers on the same plant. And with uh, making or kind of producing hemp commercially, especially for CBD or THC, you don't want to be um, producing seeds. So the fact that a lot of cannabis bros thought that this basically makes male and female flowers and you can end up with seeds, whereas most plants just uh, produce female flowers. However, there's no real reason to think that that happens as far as I know. Uh, are there any, are there many non-light generated signals for flowering? So what we were talking about here at the end is one uh, night related effect of environmental effect on flowering. As I mentioned, most species um, generally flower more quickly under warmer temperature, but there seem to be a number that flower more quickly under a cooler temperature. There's also generally the process of vernalization for some species require a really cold period in order to flower, especially in trees. Um, how, how does age of the plants influence this? That's not something I've thought much about. Paul Johnson asked how much does age of the plant affect this? And depending on the plant, it does. Some plants require a certain amount of level of maturity to be able to flower, uh, but it's not always the case. Similar to the fact that some day plants are short day, others are long day, others are day neutral. There are some plants that require a certain level of maturity. And I think maturity is usually measured by the number of nodes that the plant has. Um, they require the certain level of maturity before they will flower. Uh, but for the most part, mainly what we're working with is kind of more vegetative um, plants. And it seems to be, at least for these, not too related to age. I don't know if we're missing any other questions here. No. You have a question? Uh, so is flowering duration? I don't know much about flowering, but for example, if um, uh, flowering duration in at night temperature is longer or shorter than flowering duration at a cooler night, during the cooler night? Mm -hmm. Or like, is, is there a difference between them? What do you mean by flowering duration? So like how long the flowering um, um, takes or... Oh, just time to flowering? No, 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 no. How long the flower lasts? Yeah, flower lasts. So there is, um, I don't know about how long the flower lasts, but one thing that has come out recently um, the question is about temperature effects on how long the flower lasts. I don't know if any of the questions in this room get picked up. Um, and I don't know about how long the flower lasts. I would assume that higher temperatures would more likely kind of degrade petals more quickly. But one of the things that was found with chrysanthemum with this uh, temperature delay that we're seeing in this poinsettia picture is that it has a lot to do with um, kind of a base that the flowers are on top of, the development of that. I think it's called a capitula or something like that. I'm not a very good botanist. But it's the development of that organ that's delayed more than kind of the initiation of flowering. So I got two real simple questions. One is various types of stressors of a plant, water, salinity, nutrient, do they mediate any of this? And second, do you, it does, does it matter at all if it's an indeterminate or a determinate? Uh, the second question, I have no idea. Um, that's not something I've looked at much. Um, the first question is whether or not other environmental effects like salinity or drought stress will have an effect on flowering, right? Um, and for sure, uh, generally, stress-related responses will be perceived by the plant as a need to flower more quickly. Um, nutrient effects, um, nutrient deficiencies, uh, salinity effects, or drought will all generally induce more quick flowering. The mechanisms are still the same in terms of the light. Just, it might happen earlier and stimuli, but the, 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 the finality 
Yes, generally uh, what we say is that the biggest impact on flowering is this photoperiod effect of day length. And these other things kind of play this supplemental role of um, increasing rate of flowering by a few days maybe. Uh, there's a question here of, uh, does unexpected flowering behavior in hemp affect product quality? What it, everything we've been seeing, uh, if this hermaphroditism does take place that uh, the cannabis pros things happen, that would affect quality because if the plant is putting a lot of energy into producing seeds, then it's not putting more energy into the uh, biochemical components that we care about. Um, but as far as everything we're looking at here with uh, delays in flowering, that's not really affecting uh, quality. It's mainly just delaying uh, the rate of flowering, which takes longer time to actually get harvest and yield. No. Dan Gross, every year gets questions. My tomato says it's the biggest tomato plant I've ever had. It's gigantic, but there's no flowers. And Dan says, Did you put compost on it? And they say, Oh, yeah, I really loaded it with compost. And you get tomatoes too much nitrogen, they won't flower. They just get enormous. And they That's eternal true. youth just keep growing. No reason to flower. Huh. And it's a commercial problem. So it's the opposite of what you're saying. Yeah. You know, you got to stress them a little to get them to flower. I guess that's true with people too, right? Uh -huh. Eternal youth, no stress. If they grow up in the bubble wrap generation, yeah. they're screwed up. Yeah. Uh, mentioned stress leading to early flowering. Is there long term? Uh, hermetic benefits to moderate stressors. Uh, is what doesn't kill you make you stronger true for these organisms? Uh, that is a hard question to answer. I would generally say yes. Um, generally, I mean, stress is a pretty, a little bit of stress as we were just talking about is generally beneficial to plants. Um, and it's for product quality, it's even beneficial. Um, if you get a small amount of stress, say for even like, insect feeding or um, a small amount of UV radiation. Typically, you're gonna upregulate components that, or molecules that are beneficial for human health. And when they're beneficial for human health, they're generally also beneficial for the plant. One of the interesting things with Larry uh, Hips just had a question about uh, whether or not this pertains to Mars. The big answer in that is no, it just kind of interests me. But on, to a smaller extent, um, it does play a pretty big role in with space travel, um, whether or not those plants would experience longer days or shorter days. Mars itself has a day length about half an hour longer than Earth. So you wouldn't really expect um, much of a difference in flowering with that half hour period. Although there are plenty of experiments done where if you grow plants right around that critical period that's required to induce flowering or inhibit flowering, um, a half hour can make a difference there. But generally we'd probably be growing plants yeah, somewhere near that critical photo period. Certainly there are some plants too, like uh, wheat, which you can give basically 24 hours of light to and it'll, so you don't even have to give them a dark period and they'll just flower, set seed. Um, and that's kind of the benefit of long day plants. And this is actually an issue with short day plants because they require some dark period where they're not photosynthesizing and producing sugars to speed up their development. So this is in the 1980s, I'm first here, 
working with Frank Salisbury, and you got to fill out an ag experiment station form. And it said, describe the practical applications of your research, which we get that for your, you know, and most people think something about the night something. And Frank says, put that there are none. This is basic science. There shouldn't have been any practical applications. <laughs> and he was adamant about that. So I snuck off and I wrote some stuff and I didn't tell him that <laughs> this is basic science. Curious. That's a bad question. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for